Greetings. Hey, thanks for joining me here on the Business of Agriculture podcast. Damian Mason, as you know, your host, coming at you with a great show today, talking to a guy named Clint Brower. He's got a company called Greenfield Robotics. You know, we have drone technology. We always are using more and more innovation in agriculture. And so I thought this guy's story is a pretty good one. He's got a robotics company that's geared toward production agriculture. Before we get into that, I want to remind you that I really want you to subscribe. We've been doing the audio version of the podcast now for like three years. Started doing the video version of it just this winter. And I'd like you to go on YouTube and please subscribe so that it'll help my viewership. In other words, it'll help my find ability. Damian Mason, just type it in YouTube. Damian Mason, you'll see the playlist uh, on my channel that's called The Business of Agriculture, as well as my other podcast, The Do Business Better podcast. I would really like you to view as well as listen, and I appreciate you doing that. This episode of The Business of Agriculture, as have so so many others is sponsored by my good friends at Harvest Profit. I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get this right. Harvest Profit is a company that you can use for your agricultural enterprise to make you more profitable. Okay, so dig this. If you think that you need some help on the numbers side of your agricultural operation, or maybe you know somebody that needs some help with like cash flow, inventory, the inputs, the outputs, all that stuff that real businesses have, why are you doing that with a piece of paper and like a manila folder? For crying out loud, get with the times. Check out my friends at Harvest Profit, and you can go to harvestprofit.com and, and get a 14-day free trial. Thank you, Nick Horb. All right. I got this guy, Clint Brower. I checked out some interviews he's done with other agricultural media, and I decided, frankly, I could probably do a better job and let him tell his story about this product. He's a Kansas guy. Uh, he was raised on a farm, uh, didn't really want to be in agriculture. His dad was an ag lender. He went to Kansas State. Then he fled the coop, you know, like so many people do, went to, went to the West Coast. And then 10 years ago, he moves back to Kansas. And two years ago, he starts up a company called Greenfield Robotics. That's the quick and dirty. Clint Brower, tell me the rest of the story. Yep. So like you said, I grew up in Kansas, went to K-State, got a couple degrees. Um, couldn't wait to get far enough away from agriculture. and part of that was the equipment we had and, and uh, how old it was and all the problems, but, uh, and I uh, got into technology. I, I had a love for it, really wanted to do it and uh, spent 13 years starting companies uh, outside of large companies, small independent startups, advising them and inside big companies like Sony and Fox and uh, did everything from uh, marketing through operations to CRM, all these types of things. And um, so came back here about 10 years ago and set my sights on reducing chemical load in, in, in food period and uh, in agriculture specifically and uh, started growing vegetables organically. Didn't want to blow up the family farm uh, learning how to do this because there's really no one to teach you. And uh, we started distributing eventually into Whole Foods and hy vs and restaurants and schools. And we're still doing some of that now and uh, built greenhouses and then said, okay, I know how to do this without using chemicals at all. Never allowed myself to use them, lost a lot of crops learning how to do it. How do we do this on broad acre, on the big fields? I wanna make a big impact. And uh, decided I wanted to do no-till, um, had people talking in my ear about that and studied it and said, okay, I think this is the way to do it, but the Achilles heel of no-till is chemicals. And so that's how Greenfield Robotics came into being. Clint, here's the deal. So you came back, you were in your mid late thirties, let's say, right. And yep. you'd already been away, but you, you did have farm base to come back to. You came back to the property that your family owned and then you yep. built some greenhouses and said, I'm going to get in the uh, organic vegetable business. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, that's, I thought that was the best place to learn. No one was doing it in this area. So I thought, let's did start you, there. Did you make money doing organic vegetables eventually? We made some. And we okay. still are making some, but okay. you know, I decided not to expand that. So okay. it's, and then it's there, like a lot of things you have to have some scale. <laughs> that's, that's the tough part. I've had, to, I've had people on before and it's like, yeah, you can, you can make a little money, but you either need to be of a certain scale, no matter whether you're organic, conventional, you know, however you do it, grass fed, it doesn't matter. There's always that issue of you can make a little money, but then you've got to have the scale. So you've got some other acres sitting there at the Kansas property and you're saying, I either got to, go full tilt and make this whole farm an organic vegetable farm uh, and build more greenhouses, or I'm going to start this other company. That's kind of where the decision came from. 
Yeah, that's right. And I think growing vegetables here is possible, but the rainfall patterns are pretty hit and miss. And, and we have such a small window for a lot of vegetables. And, and when it comes to the vegetables you could grow here, squash, we have something called a squash bug that wipes out everything in sight. And so you just have to be really careful um, on, on what you do. So I said, and I really started it to get chemicals out of food. And so, you know, if you're not addressing the 250 million acres that's growing in most of the food, then what are you doing? And so that, hey. that's, that was really focal point. Now, bear in mind, uh, you know, we've had everything from organic farmers on here to regenerative stuff. And then we've had people from like Helena and Bayer and, and all the big chemical companies. I think it's important uh, that there's a place for everybody and everything and every practice in agriculture. I'm not against organic and I'm not against chemicals and, and all that. You had this thing where you said you think there's a market opportunity for agricultural products that are grown without chemistry. And there is, obviously. And you, you called on Whole Foods. You knew that from your vegetable thing. So that was the, what was the main impetus of saying, okay, I'm going to start a robotics company for production agriculture? Was it the chemistry? Was it the, the, the idea that you think the whole pattern is going to change? What was the number one reason? Well, I mean, I, I look at it from a health perspective, and I agree, there's a lot of different ways. And frankly, no-till farming doesn't exist without chemicals, right? We never even get here. And no-till farming is, in my opinion, a much better way to, to farm. So, you know, you know, I may want to reduce chemicals, but I'm very aware that we're not, we can't stand here if those chemicals aren't developed in the first place. And, and, and so no-till farming is amazing. And I really, my first two years back, uh, really planting stuff, vegetables and that were uh, 2011 was when I started scaling. It was the worst drought I think we've ever had in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And so when you start thinking about rainwater and stuff, uh, that that was the whole, right there, year one, I'm like, oh my God, I got 1,300 tomato plants I'm growing by myself here. What is happening? You know, And you start figuring out how do you conserve moisture? And that's what turned my head toward no-till at that point and started researching it and giving it a chance because I was so dead set against chemicals at that point. And so um, that's the number one reason I got into no-till and why our bots exist. When you look at no-till agriculture, there really aren't any alternatives to controlling weeds um, right now that aren't um, chemical related and so, or tillage. And so I wanted to enable no-till mechanical control of weeds. And that's, that's where we started. Now we're, we're gonna get into a lot of things. We have a lot of things in development, but that's what this first spot helps with. Okay, so there's a product that if the person is not just listening and viewing over your left shoulder, because you did a thing where you, it's kind of like TV here for you. You've got a, a <laughs> drop on a green screen. Never done this before, so yeah. yeah <laughs> it's a little so weird. You, you've got a product that uh, the viewers can see, and if you are listening and you want to see it, this is not this is not version one. This is not generation one. This is like second or third iteration. But you came with this idea. You said, all right, you don't even care whether it's conventional, no-till, whatever. You just said there's a need for weed control. And if, we're, if we can't do it, if we don't want to do it chemically, let's do it mechanically. I'm going to invent this thing that goes out in the field and weeds. That's what you came up with. Yeah, that's right. Without, without tilling and without chemicals. Or okay. chemicals and so you chemicals. came up with this prototype and now you're on your second or third iteration of this machine. Yeah, so well, I actually came up with the idea about five years ago, and I actually tested using on-farm equipment to see what would happen if I, and, and the way this current mechanism works is it's simply cutting pigweeds, it's cutting mare's tail, it's cutting stuff about an inch off the ground repeatedly, and not allowing it to either get going or to, when it comes back, we just beat it up. So I spent about two years out in various conditions, various fields, um, doing that exact thing um, with existing equipment, whether it was a weed trimmer or rotary mower, to see if this worked, because I thought, this is impossibly stupid, simple idea. This can never work. You know, and I talked to, you know, we have an advisor who's a PhD in crops genetics, and he wasn't sure, and had a crop consultant at that time. He wasn't sure. And so we tested, I tested it for two years before I finally said, you know, I think we can do this. The idea is like sending a 22 inch uh, Toro uh, walk behind mower down the row of crops. Is that kind of what the first idea was? Yeah, well, the first idea was, can we do really narrow channels and move sheep through? But uh, obviously, we, we got rid of that one right away. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was a very simple concept. And we built our first one uh, about two years ago, and we put them out there and, and kind of played around with it to see what would happen. 
okay, what are you finding? So this machine goes out and it's got an eye. How does it know what it's cutting? How does it know it's not just mowing off a row of soybeans or, or, or squash or uh, organic arugula? It doesn't matter what the crop is. You're trying to make sure that this thing is supposed to discern the difference between a pigweed and a food crop. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. I said, how can we do this as simply as possible? And so what it does is it senses rows, right? And so we use the structure of current farming to our advantage, right? Farming is heavily structured. And so if you look at other robotic startups and their machine vision and their AI and all that stuff they're doing, why some of them are failing is because they're in an unstructured environment, farming structure. And so we simply use, there's multiple technologies at hand, but the main one that allows it to not knock out your soybean or your corn or your milo is machine vision. And that was the first guy I recruited. I worked with this guy who's a genius programmer right out of college 20 something years ago. And uh, he started multiple companies and wrote the software by himself and huge traction just doing it by himself at the beginning. And he had been writing machine vision software for a decade. And that uh, companies around the world use, including NASA and Northrop and guys like that. And uh, so somehow got lucky and he agreed to move here to uh, okay. Wichita King. So, yeah, rather than a seeing eye, I mean, I'm just thinking here, uh, I've, I've been around agriculture quite a bit. I know like the tomato harvesters, they grow tomatoes not too far from my farm here in Indiana for a company called Red Gold. There's a tomato yeah. harvester that goes through and it grabs all these maters. And then it's got a seeing eye that if it's a dirt clod or it's a yellow or green, I guess, tomato, meaning it's not ready, it, that seeing eye just kicks them out. So that's, we have the technology uh, to do that. And then we're seeing more and more innovation. You could eventually see your device having an eye that somehow knows that it's a pigweed and not a food crop. But right now, the easiest thing was to operate within what agriculture, as you said, already has, which tends to be crops are planted in rows. That's right. Yep. Yep, just keep it simple. I mean, most of your weeds are, are within, you know, outside of an inch of the plant. They come up, the genetics are so powerful now, they come up, they canopy. And so we get in within an inch of the row. And if you have a decent plant, um, you don't have that many in, in row issues. And of course, we're working on our next gen will solve all, all weed problems um, without tilling as well. But uh, right now, that's the way it works. Within an inch of the plants, we just rove up and down. We put 10 of these in a field at one time and they go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the chemical companies, of course, uh, they have their story to tell and sell, and then they're up against the environmental argument. Your environmental argument is we're not using chemistry, but this thing has to be powered somehow. Is If you've got a, a fleet of robots going up and down fields, how are they being powered? Is it, is it a gas engine? Because then you're going to have your own environmental... Um, uh, shall we say, conflict. Yeah, that's right. Right now they're battery driven. And uh, this generation is definitely 100% battery driven. They carry a little over three kilowatt hour battery power on them and they can run for four to six hours. Okay. Without. Question for you then next. Benefit of robotics, drones, whatever, uh, autonomous machinery, which I believe is definitely coming. I don't have to be sitting out there on a tractor seat. Um, uh, and I fully agree with you, by the way, about the damage done to soil being tilled. When I was a kid, you know, you plowed, you disked. Sometimes you disked twice. Then you dragged a field cultivator across it. Then you planted. Then you went out there. And you still used chemistry. It just was shitty chemistry. <laughs> and, yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> and, and, and also very potent, uh, heavy loads, 55-gallon drums of the stuff being tossed out there. And then you ran a cultivator through the rows again and tilled til that soil up a couple more times. So I'm with you that we have learned, and I'm a former soil guy. I was going to be an agronomist, but I, uh, I took biochemistry at Purdue. Or I actually looked at the book, and I said, ah, ah, ah. Okay, agricultural economics, not, not, not. <laughs> but anyway, I fully agree with you that the future is no till or regenerative or something because we're going to look at all the tillage we do the way, and I've said this before, and I say it in my book, Food Fear, which I'm going to make sure you get a copy of this. My book, Food Fear, where I talk about agriculture, we're going to look back at all the tillage we do the way we look at using leeches for medical treatment uh, today. And that's how backward I think it is. We got the most valuable resource. You know, Clint, we got agriculture's most valuable asset is your dirt. Yeah. 
And yeah, then you go out and beat the crap out of it with all this tillage. So I agree with you on that. In the choir. Yep. What I'm thinking is one of the benefits for your technology is that it can go, whether I'm sitting on a tractor seat or not, I don't have to be there. It can go day or night. Now that solar panel uh, idea is going to come into it. I want to ask you about that. So I'll ask about, can these things run all day and night and how many of them are practical, et cetera. Before I do that, I've got to thank my sponsor. In case you just forgot, since we started this thing, this podcast is sponsored by the good people of Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a company founded by Nick Horeb. He is not a tech dude. He just became a tech dude because he said, there's got to be a better way. He looked around at what existed in the marketplace and said, why can't these agricultural enterprises have a good, functional, useful technology for their software. So it's a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. Essentially, you plug in all your stuff and it makes you more efficient, makes you more profitable. Go to harvestprofit.com and you can see the stuff there. He also writes a blog article that you can, it's a very short, simple read. Every week he drops one out there about what you can do to improve your business or observations on the industry of agriculture. Check out harvestprofit.com. He'll give you a 14 day free trial. All right. These machines, Clint, I'm talking to Clint Brower, Greenfield Robotics founder, product called WeBot. Needs a new name. Uh, uh, we're horrible at that. It needs a new name. I had all kinds of creative names, and then the engineer, engineers just shut me down. So well, it's, it's their fault. Remember, the engineers need to stick with uh, making that thing go up and down the rows and then leave a marketing person in charge. That's of right. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm a, I'm, I'm, into that. <laughs> I'm, I'm the entrepreneurial marketing minded guy. Um, I, I say in my, see, it's not, not bad to promote my, my other book, Do Business Better. Probably, <laughs> I talk about the five personality traits. You know, you got the product person, product, people, process, and, uh, and, and then of course, uh, the profit minded. And so I've never cared about the process. I know it has to happen, but let some engineer go out there and figure out how to get that thing mm -hmm. dialed in. No. And then the promotion, which of course I'm the promotion mind. So on a promotion minded thing, I can see going out and selling this. I can see selling this as a benefit where you don't even have to own them. For instance, because they're so efficient, you've got a fleet of 48 of these and you just drop them off, program them, and then they go and take care of all that farmer's fields. You load them up two days later, and then you run next door and to that place. Can they go all night? Not yet. We think that's possible, but um, we haven't done a lot of testing on that. You know, right now we're just focused on getting run that 12, 14 hour days. But yeah, I think night's going to be a possibility. Um, you know, we ran one test and one thing we realized real quickly is how many bugs there are at night. <laughs> so, you know, there's some things we're going to have to consider. But yeah, it's potential is there. Can they but I, 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 I've had so many nights in the last 10 years of my farm of sheep getting out, you know, I do rotational grazing, uh, greenhouses going down when it was, it was in negative five degrees that I've lost so much sleep that I told those guys, I don't want to be out there at night until we nail day. <laughs> yeah. By the way, that's the thing. If you're a livestock guy, uh, you get an ice storm and next thing you know, you got to be out there in the ice and the wind trying to get the power. I know what you're talking about. I don't miss that stuff. Okay. I, I, I kind of laugh at myself thinking I worked so hard in tech and then came and started this farm, you know, doing this farm stuff. And now it's like, people say, Oh man, this must be really hard. Greenfield robotics. And I go, this is a walk in the park compared to farming. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I, again, I've got those memories also. We were dairy farmers in the era where you, oh, you know, it wasn't like we had a bunch of hired, you know, dairy farms today are like a moving factory operation, you know, the large scale ones are where, but, you know, we were the ones that were on call 24 seven and generally working 24 seven, but. That was brutal. Can these machines that you have, can they be solar? No, there's no way. Um, you could charge the batteries, you know, off, off use um with using solar if you want but right now the power requirements are too high there, there's no way okay so the machines you obviously believe in it you invented it where do you see them going uh first well there's a couple things here one thing and that's really important is they weigh about 140 pounds and this is this is what, about 140 pounds so they're not very heavy and uh and that's 30 pounds of that is battery 
And so we, you can get out there after a rain, right? And that's one of the reasons I came up with this was you've lost control of a few fields. You just couldn't get the spray rig out there and that pigweed becomes resistant. So, so that, that really, I think is something I think farmers respond well to is the idea of, you know, I'm not going to lose control of this field of pigweed, you know, especially in this area or mare's tails. So that, that's one. So that, that's the current bot, right? Um, you still got to do your, if you're no-till, you need to do your burn down, you plant, and then we can take it from there. Um, what we don't control right now are grasses, right? So we're controlling broadleaf weeds. We're controlling your mare's tail, pigweed. Yeah, right. Grasses. Why, why are we not handling the grasses? Because right now we're simply mowing an inch off the ground and there's, there's some impact, but it's not, it's not something you can depend on. And, and you know, Roundup works just fine. For grasses still at this point, right? Yeah. Like say. So yeah. So the uh, idea is, uh, by the way, if you're a listener and you don't know what he's talking about, because remember we have people that might be in like the in the, in the cranberry harvesting business. Right, right. Yeah. There's a thing called Roundup, which is glyphosate, which you've heard about in the lawsuits. And the point is, glyphosate's the world's most used herbicide. As such, it's been used for so long and so much. We have uh, toler glyphosate tolerant weeds. What Clint is referring to is there are some weeds that have glyphosate tolerance because now we've used this herbicide for so long. This is where his machine is a fix. Whereas many of our crops are bred to tolerate to tolerate glyphosate so you can spray over the top and still kill the grasses. That's what he's talking about. And then if you're not agronomically inclined, you're saying, why wouldn't mowing off the grass kill it? Because just like your yard, you mow your grass on your yard every five to seven days, depending on rainfall, and all it does is keep coming back in a beautiful lush green. Whereas if you mow off a broadleaf weed at one inch, you whack it back and, and knock off its ability to do photosynthesis. Sorry, I just want to clarify, because you're kind of over here as the tech guy saying, wait a minute, I want to make yeah. sure that the listener, the listener that's not quite caught up gets the, the vernacular. No, that's great. Thanks for doing that. Okay. So you can't take care of grasses. It's a broad leaf. And so your application probably at first is uh, to go broad acre. Now, what about, you know, vegetables and specialty? It seems like maybe this might even have a more, a more readily acceptable audience for, I'm thinking specialty crops, no? I don't think so. I, I've, uh, we're, we're really not in that market. Um, I do think specialty crops are going to be, become a thing on broad acre, actually, eventually, um, with intercropping and stuff like that. But right now, we're really focused on corn, soybean, miles, stuff like that. And, and right now, we're constrained to 30-inch row crops, right? So they have to be planted 30 inches apart on center. Um, we, we can, you know, adjust a little bit. Now, we did make one that would work with 15-inch. We're, we're not producing that right now. And uh, we know a lot of folks have gone towards 15 inch, but you, you pick a battle and you win that one, then you move on. And speaking of that, you know, the next one we're working on, which we should have the patent done by the end of this month, we've been working on for two years in the background does control grasses. And so um, not sure when it's going to be a market, but we're working on that and we've done the testing and we, we can see that it works. And so that will kind of be a game changer in my opinion. Okay. What if, uh, okay, I'm thinking about robotics. I'm thinking about autonomous. What if then the next iteration, someone comes to you and says, I love this concept and here's my need. I want something to go up and down these rows, but I also want it to dribble out some chemical. Uh, you've got your moral side, you set out to get away from chemistry, and then you've got your capitalist side where someone says, I need a, a robot that'll come out here and just run up and down these rows and dribble out this herbicide or this insecticide, uh, something like that. Yeah, look, it's, I'm, I'm not, it, my role is not to tell farmers what to do. Um, if they're going to need something like that and we don't have a solution for that, then, then we're going to do what needs to be done. I mean, I'm not a, a crazy raving lunatic here. You know, you have to raise crops. They have to be successful. You know, it's, I'm very practical in that way. And you talked about, you're not a process guy. I kind of am. And so, you know, we've, I've already thought this, what does it look like 10 years out? What are the systems we have out there and how does this work? And, uh, and what you've just talked about, we've entertained that scenario already um, for dealing with grasses and that, and that that's kind of sitting there in the background, what we'll do if, if you know, this next mechanism doesn't work well, but it uh, looks like it will. But uh, a lot of those things, insecticides, you know, there's, there's no way around it. Um, you're gonna have to, if you get, here, down here we get sugarcane aphids and milo. Well, you can't just sit there and hope. It's not gonna happen. Um, the crop becomes unharvestable at some point. And so, you know, you have to spray. 
And, um, and you know, is there an OMRI certified spray for that? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, maybe the costs aren't quite right at this point. So I'm practical at that point, you know, we're just trying to make an impact and, and get a path there for folks. So, uh, okay. The business side, how soon until I'll be able to go and say, Hey, I'm going to start a custom. Cause I almost think your buyer originally might be a custom person. They buy enough that they can do it for themselves. It's kind of like around here. I know some people that, they have some hog barns and they bought the manure handling equipment and they do their hog barns and then 16 other people's hog barns manure handling because it made not enough sense for them to own that infrastructure just for their two hog facilities. But if they can do custom 12 other people's, I almost think that's the model for something like this. I don't need a dozen robotic weeders for just me, but if I get a dozen more people, is that the model? Yeah, the model is it's a robotics on demand or as a subscription, right? So we show up, you sign a deal with us. This year we have 10 farms signed and one of them's mine. And we're working across, I think, five or six different crops. And um, we show up, we take pictures of it. When it's ready, time to go, we show up, we deploy the 10 bots and we run them through your field until we get done. This year we asked, don't give us any more than 40 acres. We're still learning the software, still being refined this year. Last year was hardware, this year is software. And so we call that a beta trial. So it is as a service. We're not gonna sell these bots to anyone. Um, I think that we're still learning from them, trying to give it to someone to run it, it would be a, a fool's errand. And they're gonna have a lot of problems with it. So um, we internalize that risk and, and we work with them that way. So it is a subscription. And what we tell them is, we're gonna run these things over your field between two and five times during the season, with the average being three for soybeans. So that's, that's kind of the model. That's fantastic. So yeah, you're, you're essentially the service provider right now while you're working out kinks and it's still absolutely a product and development. You know, you call it it's the beta trial. Your people that you got signed up, the nine farms that are not yours, I'm assuming those are people that are early adopters. You know, the same person that uh, tried something new back in 1980 when no-till was a new thing or tried something new in 2000 when it was, you know, whatever, uh, ripping the soil with a bee ripper, whatever the hell it is. You've got early adopters right now what is their reaction? You know, I, it, it's funny because I, I, you know, I live in the tech world and the ag world. And I think one of the things when we talk to some of our angel investors or people we meet in the Silicon Valley is I correct them very quickly. And I tell them, you know, farmers expect this. Like no one's surprised. When we show up with this, every single farmer's reaction goes, you know, I was thinking you might show up someday. And so they're not shocked. And farmers, you know, they have pretty darn sophisticated technology. And, uh, you know, the software you're promoting and, and so on and so forth. I mean, farmers are very sophisticated operators, in my opinion, most of them. And so way more sophisticated than the average mid middle le level manager in a corporation, to be honest with you. So many variables. Yeah, and so yeah. when we show up, they think, you know, and, and I don't over pitch, right? We told these guys, hey, we're going to come out of the gate this year. The gate's going to open. The horse might fall over. The rider falls off it. And here we come, have your chemicals, part of our trial was have your chemicals ready to go in case we're not doing well, right? And so we have that communication going on. We know by late in the season, things will be going pretty smoothly. And so farmers react to that well, because I'm telling it like it is. Yeah, so. I think that's exactly right. And uh, you and I both agree that, uh, you know, it's an industry that is a great deal more technologically advanced than the average person understands. And then, uh, you know, the the average person out there in suburbia thinks that we're out here in our bib overalls with a hoe walking down the field. And you know, it's interesting. There's such a, a complete d disparate perception. On the one hand, they think that we're out here with our bib overalls on and our hoe with a scarecrow in the field. And on the other hand, they think that we're all controlled by Monsanto and we have these, uh, machines that go out and just poison their food so it's like what what the hell what, where are we you know but uh, neither of them are actually anywhere close to accurate but yeah the machines i don't think that if i told any of my farmer buddies here in indiana you know uh, i got a guy that's got a robotics thing it's a you know it's in about its second year it's coming right along and it's just going to go down that, that row right there and weed your stuff they'd be like oh it'd be neat to see and it wouldn't be like oh i've never heard of such a thing oh it'll never work it would be right. I the trials because like you said we expect them. yeah that's right you know and and it's it's moving forward quickly and uh and i think the the one thing we haven't talked about that we're really focused on it is it, it turns out the type of farming i really do around my farm is regenerative ag 
right? And so we, we do the rotational grazing, we do the cover crops on that. And we're, you know, using cropland over and over. There's always a growing root, no-till, all that type of stuff. And that, that's the R&D lab for um, Greenfield Robotics. And so that's really what we're working on. This is the first incarnation, but we want to have a suite of things that make that possible. My opinion is right now, regenerative ag, there are elements of it you can somewhat scale, but you can't scale all of it. And, uh, and it makes it a lot easier if you can get out there and you're losing some of your weather dependence, right? I don't think that autonomy for autonomy's sake is, is that big of a deal. I mean, I think that's great or whatever, but really the value is we've got small bots out there that can get the job done when you can't get out there with your big tractors, right? Yeah, and so that, that, is, that is such a big deal. And that idea of small um, uh, moving forward, I think is a powerful one and I think is right. I know some people doubt that. We've got a lot to learn ourselves, but I really do think that's the way things are gonna go. I not only don't doubt it, I touted it in this book about food and agriculture called Food Fear. If you've not picked up your copy, please do so. It's available at DamianMason.com as a hardback, as an ebook, and as an audio book. And I'll tell you what, I talked about this very thing, about autonomous machinery, because I said equipment for the first time at Clint here is 46, Damian Mason's 50. I can tell you that from the time I was a baby, one thing has been constant. From the time he was a baby, one thing has been constant. Equipment has gotten bigger, 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 and heavier and heavier and heavier. And what does big heavy equipment do? It squishes the soil. Does squished soil produce well, Mr. Brower? No, not, not at all, so, barely. So equipment like yours getting smaller and having more of them means that now we're not squishing our precious soil. So I believe that you are right. What else do you think about when you think about the future of this uh, technology and ag? You know, I think that um, there's a couple things that uh, I focus on. Um, so we're solving technical problems in, in farming, right? But I think we have market problems, and I, I think this has become very evident with COVID, and you could see people moving this direction. One thing is farmers put out a tremendous amount of capital. Most of them have to have an operating loan, and their margins are low. I'm unaware of any businesses where people put that much capital forward to get so little return, and I've seen a lot. You know, as a young wonder kid in the internet thing, so I got to see a lot of things earlier than most would get to see. Yeah, when you're and talking, so, to, you're talking about a farm like that's up the road from you or me that's got um, they've got a million dollar operating loan and about a few million dollars of just existing capital. That's not even uncommon, to be honest. I mean, right? So you're talking about four million dollars, and at the end of the year, they're going to come up with a net of a hundred, two hundred. Hell, that's right. That's no, there's no business out there that does that um, besides farming. And so, but, but yet you take that same crop and from the minute it leaves the truck and it goes to wherever you take it, the value add between field and market is unbelievable. And every farmer knows this, yeah. but no one's done anything about it. And so you ask me where, and, and, and it takes less capital actually at this point to make products with that given the margin you get and the market then. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we've, I think agriculture is going through a big shift of local and also disintermediation, right? Direct to consumer, whether it's e-commerce or whatnot. Yeah. And so I think those are a big deal. And when you start doing that, the, you start creating that bridge between the consumer and the farmer. So they better understand each other, right? Because what you said is absolutely true. They, the disconnect is huge. A lot of my friends in LA that you know I used to work with are like, we got to ban glyphosate. And I'm like, you ban that, here's what's coming, mm -hmm. right? It's going to be a lot worse. Right. And so uh, we got to bridge that disconnect. And the closer they get to the food, the more they understand their farmers and what they're doing, the better, the better off we are. And, and if you look at what do we have, we put 10 of these things out there, we're recording that. And so we have an audit trail. So we could tell you what's happening in that field. We could tell the consumer what's happening in the field if the farmer wants us to. And that's very interesting. Yeah. So you're, you know, that's obviously been a big thing now is that uh, data gathering through, uh, you know, these companies are doing that and your products can do it just as well as, as anyone else's, right? I mean, you're out there, you're covering the ground. Yeah, we can gather all that data, you know, and I know a lot of people data, 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 they look at Google and all that and data is worth all this money and that. I'm not so sure about that in agriculture, to be honest with you. 
Um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've lived in that world too. And, and uh, it's important for the farmer for production. I think it's good for an audit trail, whether it's worth a whole lot of money. I'm not sure about that. His name's Clint Brower. You've been listening to the Business of Agriculture, the podcast that is sponsored by my good friends at Harvest Profit. You can go to harvestprofit.com and find out what that company founded by my man Nick Horb can do for you. It's about managing your inputs and your outputs. Remember, agriculture is a business. No matter what your agricultural enterprise is, you need a software solution to help you become more profitable. Harvest Profit is that company and is that product going to help you because remember you don't care about harvest profit you care about your profit go to harvestprofit.com all right clinton brower last thought greenfield robotics if somebody wants to learn more about this how do they find you yeah they should go to facebook.com slash greenfield robotics or twitter uh, we have greenfieldrobotics.com. it's a pretty simple website to be honest we're very focused on product right now and uh, right now it's all about getting these robotic robots made oh yeah look this is not easy you're taking electronics, mechanical, and software, and you're putting them together. And for the first time, the software drives the other two things, yeah. right? We use software to solve mechanical problems, right? Yeah. And that's different. Yeah. And so it's very complicated. It's very hard what we're doing. I wish you well. I love the concept, love the entrepreneurialism. Uh, you, you need a little help on promotion. Uh, we, bought, <laughs> we Bought is not going to make it, but uh, I, I can help you with that. And anyway, uh, I do appreciate you being on here, seriously. So folks, check it out. You know, keep your eye on the horizon. That's what we always do, uh, us progressive-minded agricultural people. We know the future's going to change. You're not out there with your John Deere 4020 and that damn cultivator tearing up the ground anymore. At least you shouldn't be. So uh, thanks for being on here. Hey, appreciate it. What are you going to go plant today? You said you were going out to drill a plant. plant drain, I got to plant some drainage areas uh, that were just redone with excavation, stuff that washed out. So we put in drain pipes, riprap to handle that. They're going to get seeded. I hate to say it, I'm going to use fescue because fescue is not good for anything except for holding ditch banks. So nice. that's what I got to get to before the rains come this weekend. All right, till next time, I'm right. Damian Mason. Right. He's Clinton Brower. Thanks for being here. It's the business of agriculture.